This is a production of PBS Charlotte. This week on Off the Record, Mecklenburg's on again, off again mask mandate is off again. So will you keep wearing a mask anyway? And how about your kids at school? We'll talk about it. A report on racism in Mecklenburg and a rough start for the mayor's racial equity initiative. Also finding a replacement for County Commissioner Ellis Scarborough. New election maps in North Carolina? Well, maybe. New changes at the old Eastland Mall, soccer and secrets at City Halls about Eastland Mall and North Carolina soldiers shipping out to a possible war zone. Lots to cover next on PBS Charlotte. And from our PBS Charlotte studios in historic Plaza Midwood, I'm Jeff Sonier, and we're off the record talking about the stories you've been talking about this week. And if you watch the news, read the news, and listen to the news, well, you'll recognize the names and faces around our virtual table. Steve Crump from WBTV, Christi uh, Christina Bowling from the Charlotte Ledger, and Katie Peralta Soloff from uh, Axio Charlotte. Thanks for joining us this morning, gang. You can also join the conversation from home. Just uh, email your questions and comments to off the record at uh, WTV. TVI.org. Well, I guess we got the uh, pandemic version of uh, Groundhog Day this week. Uh, the health director for the county and the county commissioners emerging from their lair, not afraid of the long shadow of COVID so much anymore and uh, ending the mask mandates that they could have extended if they chose to. Uh, so much going on. It, I guess it feels like something we should celebrate, but uh, it also feels like we've kind of been here before. I know, Christina, you were watching uh, much of that uh, interesting meeting uh, as the county commissioners discussed this earlier in the week. Tell us a little bit about uh, that decision and uh, how it all came about. Sure. So, I mean, just to your point, they actually, Raynard Washington, the county health director, actually called it, I think he called it COVID-19 response 2.0 uh, <laughs> slash we've been here before. Yeah, um, the, like uh, the vote was unanimous. Um, you know, it doesn't officially take uh, effect. There was a 10 day waiting period before it officially takes effect. So um, I don't know about your world, but in my corners, it seems to have dropped immediately. Um, people are where I'm going out, I see a lot of people without masks on. Um, the meeting was definitely, um, although it was a unanimous vote, it was definitely a very hot meeting. A lot of speakers from the public um, just having very strong opinions about masks, just as we've seen in this throughout this entire pandemic. Yeah, and the county commission didn't make their decision in a vacuum either. The, the, the governor this week and the state health secretary also said they recommend now dropping these mask mandates at uh, cities and counties and even uh, school districts. So um, something's changing out there. The information that the decision makers are getting is obviously leading them to make different decisions now. Uh, I, it feels like we're moving in the right direction on this thing, but still a lot of uh, uh, resistance, I guess, to taking those masks off. You know, in many respects, there's still a line in the sand there, especially when you factor in what's going to happen with the schools. And even in as much as, I guess, coming to some consensus uh, as CMS, I mean, when you look at some of the outlying areas, you can see where there's been uh, rather contentious battle lines drawn. But at the same time, you know, the question is, what page will the local school board jump on? Yeah, and they meet next week. Um, uh, any thoughts from anybody about where the school board will land on this one, given all the new advice that they're getting to go in a different direction than they've gone in over the past couple of months? Well, I think with the governor coming out and saying, you know, that he recommended a relaxation of those rules for schools and for municipalities, that um, it stands to reason that they're gonna definitely be taking that into consideration. Katie? You know, I think um, the the governor and uh, local officials have also said um, several times that, uh, you know, this is not the end of masks, it's just the end of mask mandates. And that means that if, if children or if businesses or if parents want to continue wearing them, if they feel more comfortable wearing them, then they absolutely can. It's anybody's guess as to how much that will actually happen here. Um, I think it will, um, it will just be an interesting dynamic to see play out because I, I do know a lot of parents are, uneasy about this you know um the the vaccination rate among elementary school aged children is like just over 25 percent mm. in north carolina it's very low um so it's you know it, it could be uh it could be contentious when it gets down to the school debates um yeah. but i do think that they will end up following governor cooper's 
recommendation. And I do think that other uh, other school boards will as well. Yeah, the, 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 the new county health director was a little bit confusing. He said he, you know, he was not recommending mask mandates, as you mentioned, but he still recommended wearing a mask, which, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, there's a, a lot of people don't see the, the, the difference between a mask mandate and a recommendation to wear one. But uh, there is a difference, and, and that difference is, is what we heard from the county commission this week. By the way, speaking of schools, we also heard from the uh, General Assembly, right around the same time, Governor Cooper was saying uh, he was recommending school boards uh, drop their mask mandates. The uh, General Assembly uh, in Raleigh uh, passing a bill that allows parents to opt out of uh, mandates, even if the school board does decide to continue those. So, uh, you know, mixed messages. How many times have we talked I'm about that? I'm surprised, though, that, that yeah. the uh, State Board of Education, you know, which is kind of like the state school board, if you will, hasn't uh, come down with some kind of unilateral decision to be dispensed to a lot of the school districts across uh, North Carolina. Yeah, well, it's, it sounds like where we're moving is decentralizing these decisions even more than we have so far, not just leaving them in the hands of the school board, but in the case of the General Assembly's bill, literally giving parents the option to decide whether their kids wear a mask or don't wear a mask, which pretty much neutralizes any sort of mask mandate to begin with, doesn't it? Uh, I'm going to say yes on that. <laughs> Raised and answered, I suppose. But uh, yeah, again, a lot of information to, to, to process uh, this week and, um, and uh, more to process next week as the CMS school board and other school boards start to meet and talk uh, about what they're going to do on a district by a district basis. We'll talk about it again, obviously, because this is uh, the one problem that doesn't seem to want to go away, unfortunately. Uh, we heard uh, at the end of last week, actually, about uh, a uh, heard a report rather from um, uh, about uh, the history of racism in Mecklenburg County and how that uh, history of, uh, of racism and the things that government have has have done over the the years have led to where we are today and 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 what to do about it today Steve um, I don't know that the report tells us anything we didn't already know but it it did serve as kind of a valuable history lesson I guess right I, I think it did, but at the same time, there's kind of a mixed message here from the standpoint of where the uh, mayor's initiative that kind of worked with the Charlotte, um, um, what used to be the Charlotte Chamber and the like, and you know they bring somebody in who ends up having to resign because of, of a past controversy yeah. in Ohio. So you know, in that regard, it seems as though while it's well intended. It could be sputtering coming out of the starting gate, Jeff. Yeah, I, that mayor's equity initiative is separate from the county's uh, similar efforts, I suppose. But uh, in the in the minority community, it's all kind of looked at together as a package. And uh, you know, when you see on the one hand a report that reports in depth on on what's happened over the the, the decades. And on the other hand, you see a stumble out of the starting gate, as you mentioned. It, it makes you wonder about the process, about how we do go about, you know, making amends or, or, or investing in the same communities that used to be uh, discriminated against. Well, at least we're having the dialogue. Yeah. But, the, the, but the, uh, again, a lot of the dialogue this week has uh, surrounded the controversy on that uh, that new appointee that uh, is no longer the appointee. Uh, it, you try to get away from the controversy and get to the answers, and, and I'm not sure that this week accomplished any or any of that at all. You know, that that's uh, I, I don't know where the the process goes from here. Do you have a sense of what happens next with all this? I think it's back to the drawing board in a lot of ways. Um, you know, in some regards, perhaps a better vetting of whomever comes into that situation. And how does uh, the uh, folks that are involved with that from both the private sector and local government walk away without having any egg on their face? Yeah, kind of raises the question about uh, transparency too, whether um, when the city's investing, I guess they're talking about $250 million over time uh, to be spent on equity, uh, equity initiatives. Uh, when the decisions on who's leading those efforts aren't being made by a public body, but by essentially a, a chamber of commerce, a business-led body, uh, I, I makes you it begs the question of whether city council steps in and, and takes a larger role in, in some of this some um, leadership going forward. Well, and considering that's... that it uses the word mayor, yeah, you got to <laughs> ask that question, Christina. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's been kind of confusing for the public this yeah. week. Um, you know, it has the mayor's name on it, but the mayor was 
you know, early kind of distancing herself from the selection of, I think her name is Kimberly Henderson. Um, and so I, I just as, you know, as a member of the public, I think it's been confusing to figure out, um, I guess, who, who was responsible for the vetting. And then when we did, you know, it was, um, it was not really made clear how how the vetting uh, was done and also, you know, how much they were actually aware of when they selected her for that position. Yeah, the process seems a little muddled at best. And uh, I guess uh, the stumble out of the starting gate will hopefully lead to a, a clearer path going forward, both uh, on the city council's part in, ter in terms of oversight and transparency and on the uh, business uh, community's part in terms of, as you mentioned, the vetting of people who are, are expected to lead something that's obviously going to be very high profile, uh, you know, for, for a very long time here in the community. Um, speaking of high profile, uh, Eastland Mall is uh, kind of hand in hand with the uh, success, the coming success of the MLS soccer team. Uh, we heard this week about some changes, physical changes that are happening at the old mall site itself. And, uh, and Katie, a lot of those changes caught folks off guard out there at uh, what's been for the most part an abandoned 80 acre site for a long time, right? Yeah, so the uh, Eastland Mall um, flea market and skate park were a couple of kind of makeshift initiatives that went up um, years ago. Uh, you know, Eastland has largely been abandoned for years. So I think members of the community wanted to put the space to use. Um, quite frankly, these are both extremely popular uh, kind of da uh, daily uh, efforts going on, uh, especially the skate park. It's something that you can find people at pretty much all the time. Um, but the flea market is one thing that started in 2015. Um, they had a lease with the city. They, you know, pay taxes to the city. It is packed every single weekend. Um, they, they were given a heads up that the lease would expire with the city as develop as you know as developers broke ground on the new um, Eastland redevelopment. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's not hard. You know, these folks have made a livelihood out of um, selling their goods uh, every weekend from you know, fresh produce to, uh, you know, prepared food to clothing and electronics. Um, and to have that Band-Aid ripped off is pretty jarring, I think. Um, I've been there a couple of times and it's it's really something to see. Um, so the city has made no uh, secret of the fact that this was always the plan uh, to let the lease expire. And I think that there was just a little bit of hope from the community that there would be something else waiting for them, you know, some other public space perhaps uh, to, to use moving forward. Um, as for the skate park, um, again, it's it's just a huge question. I know the organizers of that have invested tens of thousands of dollars into making it this really cool facility that has, you know, ramps and I'm obviously not a skater, so I can't speak to exactly <laughs> what they did, but, um, it's a shame. It's a loss for the community. Yeah, and it speaks to how long uh, we've all been waiting for something to happen out at Eastland Mall. The fact that these makeshift uh, uh, operations, the flea market, the skate park have been in existence for six, seven, eight years in some cases. They've kind of become the established norm because there's been so much inactivity out at that site for, for so long before this, this project that's now about to start. Um, is, and is, we is remember when there was talk of putting a movie studio there. Yeah, and a ski slope yeah. and uh, all yeah. the other, you know, failed, you know, tried and failed plans. Uh, th this particular plan is getting close to breaking ground, but it, it doesn't break ground in its original form. Um, Katie, you've been our uh, David Tepper whisperer for you know for the times you've been on the show here. Uh, talk a little bit about how the MLS uh, headquarters, the, the team headquarters that was supposed to be at Eastland wound up not being at Eastland, and some of the discussions that went on behind the closed doors that led to that decision and some of the other uh, uh, soccer and Eastland Mall decisions. Yeah, so the decision not to put the MLS headquarters happened sort of quietly and sort of non-dramatically yeah. um having having the headquarters at eastland was seen as this sort of really sexy draw um obviously david tepper and his crew would invest a lot of money in the facility there would be you know corporate headquarters there etc um in reality i i think that maybe the physical presence of the headquarters wouldn't have been as spectacular as maybe we originally thought it would have been um so that those plans shifted i can't even remember what year is it anyway uh i think that shifted in like 2019 or 2020 or right. something 
Um, so they scaled back the plans for the corporate presence at MLS, but they still will have their soccer facility there. Um, you know, there's still going to be a huge soccer presence at, at Eastland um, from outdoor, you know, practice fields to, uh, I, I believe there's indoor practice fields. I might be wrong on that. Um, but the MLS headquarters themselves will be at um, Bank of America Stadium. So uh, the, the investment kind of division has shifted over the years, um, but that doesn't mean that there's not going to be soccer out there. It's just one component of a pretty substantial investment in that facility or in the redevelopment rather that will include everything from, you know, a grocery store to residences to park space to, you know, office space, et cetera. So um, like you said, it's been a long time coming. Uh, it feels like there have been a lot of stops and starts in the Eastland redevelopment plans, but now they're actually going to break ground soon, which yeah. is, um, it's an exciting time for the east side. Yeah, when the shovels go in the ground, I think we'll all be a little bit amazed given the, the length of this process. Uh, one other thing I thought was interesting in the uh, the revelations about those uh, behind closed doors talks is uh, was the fact that the money that the city was going to spend, a lot of folks wanted to make sure that the branding of the team was Charlotte and not Carolina because it's, I, I think the feeling was city hall money, city taxpayer dollars. It ought to have Charlotte's name on the the jersey and on the, the team itself. Uh, I guess that is an important, although kind of nebulous uh, advantage to, you know, having, you know, some financial say in that particular team's finances and uh, and the help that the city's offering, right? Yeah, that, that does seem to have been a priority for them. Although at the end of the day, I'm not sure if what city council said about the MLS team's name would have actually affected what the MLS team's name ended up being. <laughs> I think Dave Tepper probably would have done his made his own decision regardless um however of course charlotte did end up in the name um i think they just wanted to have their stamp on it you know if charlotte's investing all this money in the team and um you know the facilities and they want to they, they want people to know that it's a charlotte-based thing yeah and it makes you wonder that with uh, david tepper's investments down in south carolina for the carolina panthers i guess they want to make sure that um Soccer doesn't uh, perhaps follow them across the state line to, to South Carolina as well at some point. Yeah. By the way, we, we got a chance to go up to Chesterfield County, Virginia, recently to a, another development, Old Mall, same developer. They've got volleyball there instead of soccer. And it's a big success. So it, it really does give you a, a sense of what Eastland could be, become, you know, what the Eastland Mall site could become in the next couple of years based on what that particular developer has done in a similar situation up in Virginia. So I guess everybody wins if, uh, if Eastland turns into the kind of development that uh, makes uh, life better on the east side, brings in more tax dollars, and um, and uh, takes an old abandoned property and turns it into something valuable going forward. Um, North Carolina's uh, been looking at the maps that they uh, use to elect uh, Congress uh, members and uh, the state legislature for months, maybe years, but uh, it looks like we finally may have some maps that uh, if everyone doesn't necessarily agree on, at least they can work with uh, for this particular election. Uh, I don't know how closely you all have watched this, but anyone want to weigh in on the, the decision this week on uh, the newly drawn maps that hopefully will, will be the, uh, the maps we use for the next election? I, I think in some ways a lot of it relies on history, uh, especially when you look at the relationship that the state legislatures had with courts in North Carolina, and even on the federal level, going all the way back to what was decided in the uh, Fourth Circuit out of Richmond several years ago. And, you know, they got into the whole thing about gerrymandering and the like. And I believe the phrase that kind of resonated with a lot of people basically talked about how a lot of things were done with surgical precision hmm. to disenfranchise a lot of voters. So based on that, I think that there's kind of some history and precedent in terms of where this thing could actually go. Yeah, I read a quote last night from a, a story on WRAL in Raleigh from Michael Bitzer, who's a uh, political scientist from Catawba College. He called the uh, new districts drawn shockingly competitive, which means that, uh, and I think the, the way the, the, the numbers lay out, at least for the congressional districts, you've got, uh, I guess, six seats that look like they're going to be Republican seats. You've got... Uh, uh, three or four seats that look like Democratic seats, and then four swing seats that would could go either way based on the maps. That's a lot different than the, the last round of maps. And I guess that, you know, for those who don't like gerrymandering, I guess that represents progress of some sort, right? 
Yeah, but to use the title from a Mel Brooks film, it could also be high anxiety. And I'm going to tell you why, <laughs> you know, because you have the whole Madison Cawthorn thing is happening. Uh, G.K. Butterfield out of the first district isn't going to run again. So even though you have an added congressional seat in our state, there's still, you know, I guess some tight wire dancing that's going to happen as it relates to a fluid map that can be used to uh, um, uh, carry out the elections. Any other thoughts on, on, on where this leaves us, both as, uh, you know, for the next election and politically with the Republicans and Democrats in Raleigh, you know, continuously battling over these sorts of things? I, I guess the one thing I noticed in particular also is that the new districts they drew for themselves, the state legislature, also perhaps reduces the possibility of that old supermajority and opens the possibility of more vetoes uh, by a, you know by an opposing governor that would ultimately stick. But that's a those maps I guess will be talked about again in court next week, and uh, we should have a final decision hopefully in time for a primary in May. That's the uh, objective for both parties I suppose, although both parties would like to have an advantage as well. Um, politically, locally, uh, C County Commission also talked about replacing uh, longtime County Commissioner Ellis Scarborough, who is out on a, a medical leave indefinitely. Can we talk a little bit about uh, Ella's situation and uh, how the county is going to move forward from here, uh, replacing replacing her uh, on, on the board? Sure. So the commissioners decided last week that they were going to um, replace her by March 22nd, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it sounds like early on in October and maybe December, she sort of sounded the flag that she needed to take a medical leave of absence. That didn't seem to make its way to the rest of the commissioners, um, at least not formally. Uh, and so when they took up the issue this past week, um, there was a lot of debate and discussion about, you know, how to handle it and also how to pay her, whether she should be, she, she requested a paid medical leave, I believe. Um, and so there was just, you know, a lot of discussion and question about whether um, she should continue on um, receiving payment. You know, of course, she's a longtime county commissioner. And so there was feeling that she, um, you know, deserved that. And then others saying, well, she's not fulfilling her role, um, you know, uh, maybe she should should not be paid. Um, so anyway, it was an interesting discussion this week. Yeah, it was kind of a two-part decision. One is what do we do about Ella's situation specifically? And part two is how do we replace Ella ultimately? Um, the, the replacement process, it's uh, I guess kind of, uh, I don't know if you would call it making, making it up as we go along, but we don't often get ourselves in these situations in our elected boards. Can we talk a little bit about how she will be replaced and, um, and what that's gonna look like from, uh, from us sitting on the outside looking in at the county commission? I think it's a two-pronged process, and I could be slightly inaccurate on this one, but I believe that there's some influence from the Democratic Party yeah. as well as those who are sitting on the county commission. But perhaps the bigger question in all this comes down to two words, and that is, where's Ella? <laughs> yeah, a lot of folks wondering about her health right now and uh, and and her well-being right now. I know a little bit of the uh, the the breakdown of the the process. I believe the county commission is going to choose seven candidates. You'll actually be able to apply for the job. Uh, between now and next week, and those seven candidates will be interviewed publicly and vetted publicly. Um, it, I wonder, uh, and I know at one point they talked about only reaching out to people who have served before. That's not gonna be the case in the actual process, but uh, any thoughts on, on how bringing in a, a new face on the county commission, probably a Democratic face, but still new, might change the dynamic on the board, um, in particular since we've got an uh, election coming up for county commission so soon afterwards. Any thoughts on that? I think, Go well, ahead, as, as we saw from this week's uh, county commission meeting, um, some of these issues that they are deliberating, be it masks, uh, et cetera, like re really are quite divisive um, yeah. and really draw a lot of uh, response from the community. I do think that whoever um whoever they pick and it, it seems sorry going back to that point um these meetings become like even more drawn out <laughs> more controversial <laughs> the topic yeah. uh because everyone needs to weigh in um uh, unfortunately we haven't heard from ellis scarborough in quite some time yeah. so i think whoever does replace her probably will make their voice heard um which is a change obviously from from what we're used to for uh that seat um but you know like you said elections are coming up people yeah. want to um you know make a name for themselves and i think that a, a lot of them will um 
you know, continue to weigh in on these topics. I don't, I don't know uh, what that person will, will look like or where they'll come from, but, um, you know, I think we'll start to get a little bit more clarity and it'll be interesting to compare this process to the process that city council went through last year in selecting um, a replacement for the at-large seat vacated by James Mitchell. Um, you know, ultimately they did go with someone with uh, with with experience on council. Um, and we clearly did hear from county commissioners who would prefer someone with yeah. some sort of politics uh, experience. Well, regardless of who they choose to replace her, we do wish, we, we do wish Ella the best. She's a, a long time uh, servant of this community and a, and a community leader. And, and we do hope that um, her health issues uh, that she gets she gets through them. In our last minute or so, uh, Steve, take us take us to Fort Bragg and tell us about the deployment of troops this week uh, on their way to uh, a, a very stressful situation in Europe. Very quickly, uh, at last count, more than 5,000 troops, a couple different deployments. They've gotten pretty good at this at Fort Bragg going back the last 30 years. You've had Panama, uh, two Gulf Wars, Afghanistan and Iraq. So this is just kind of, I guess, more or less uh, uh, what they carry out in motion, what they do with the 82nd Airborne and the community supporting them. Yeah, 2,000 paratroopers from the 82nd Airborne uh, going to Poland for now, hopefully not into a war zone, but we don't know what's going to happen over there between Russia and the Ukraine. But uh, whenever there's a there's strife overseas, uh, we're affected here in North Carolina because of our military presence here. So we wish them and their families uh, the best. And uh, we're out of time. But uh, I appreciate you all joining us for a good discussion this week at home as well. Uh, if you enjoyed our discussion or even if you didn't, send your comments and questions to off the record at uh, WTVI.org. Once again, thanks for joining us this week on Off the Record, and we'll see you next time. Production of PBS Charlotte.